Hello and welcome everyone to another CKS webinar entitled The Regions of Resistance with Dr. Jenna Grant. My name is George Chigas. Before we get started, let me say a few words about CKS. Um, as many of you may already know, the Center for Kamaya Studies is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. Founded in 1999, uh, CKS promotes research to build knowledge and understanding of important topics in the humanities and social sciences dealing with Cambodia and the Mekong region. Um, it does this through annual research fellowships and other activities such as webinars like this one. Um, the CKS main offices and libraries are located on the beautiful grounds of Wat Dum Nak in Siem Reap. We invite you to please visit us in person or online and, and see the, the incredible facilities here. Um, I want to mention also, it's just a kind of um, current event that CKS will be hosting the third Siem Reap book fair here in Wat Dum Nak at the CKS offices. And this year's theme is open a book, broaden your mind. Uh, um, we'd like to invite authors, publishers, and book lovers to share your love for reading with our community's youth and children by donating books to the fair, which will take place on the 4th and 5th of May this year, as I said, at the Center for Kamai Studies at Wadam Na. Um, if you do, if you are able to, to come to the book fair, we invite you to visit the booth, share books, share wisdom, to get free reading books to enjoy. And the booth will be hosted by our young volunteers. So today's webinar is called Regions of Resistance. Um, it will deal with the important issue of drug resistant malaria and its implications in the greater Mekong subregion and how scientists and policymakers try to navigate the ethics and politics of science while determining how to allocate scarce health resources in Cambodia. Questions about ethics and politics of science come to the fore when the greater Mekong region is used as an experimental site for the elimination of malaria to be applied in other places where malaria is endemic, such as Africa. This involves reimagining the idea, the concept of region. Um, Africa, South East Asia relations take center stage here, producing a region that is not geographically contiguous, yet it is entangled through research, parasites, post colonial conflict, and the biographies of scientists and health professionals. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Jenna Grant from the University of Washington here to discuss these topics with us. Um, Dr. Grant is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and a faculty member at the Center for Southeast Asia and its diaspora at the University of Washington in Seattle. Her research explores post-colonial and Cold War histories and contemporary medical, technological, and visual practices in Cambodia. Her recent work includes a monograph, Fixing the Image, Ultrasound and the Visuality of Care in Phnom Penh, published by the University of Washington Press in 2022. Um, Dr. Grant was a 2022-2023 CKS Fellow and a Fulbright US Scholar during which time she collaborated with the Khmer Studies program, PhD program at the Royal University of Phnom Penh. With that said, I'd like to invite Dr. Grant to join us and take the stage. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I want to thank everyone who's able to join. It's uh, 6 p.m. in Seattle where I'm based. Um, and I know it's different. It's in the morning uh, of Friday in Cambodia um, and mainland Southeast Asia and different times. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I want to thank Seret in particular for organizing this and George for being the host. I want to start just by mentioning that the research on which this talk is based uh, has been supported uh, by the Center of for Khmer Studies, of course, but also by the Fulbright um, US Scholar Award and by my university, the University of Washington and the French National Research Agency. Um, and I'm grateful to all of those institutions for their support over the years. This is a project that I've been working on on and off for a long time. Um, uh, taking a job in Seattle meant uh, that the, the project was sort of sidelined for a while as I was working on my book, but I'm returning back to it now. And indeed the landscape of resistance has changed quite a bit over the past 10 years. This is the general structure of my talk today. First, I want to propose that anti-malarial drug resistance calls for different ways of thinking about region. And then I'll give a brief history of malaria drug resistance in the greater Mekong subregion. I'll explain my thinking about borderlands as a region. And then to conclude uh, the region of non-touching um, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So how do we work with and thus also disturb different practices of making regions? This is the dictionary definition of the term in English, an area or division, especially part of a country or the world having definable characteristics, but not always fixed boundaries. An administrative district of a city or country, the Mon, Dain, Sankat, there are a few different Camaro terms that would work uh, for this sense of the term. Region in English is also used to talk about a part of the body, such as the abdominal region. And it's also used to talk about an area of activity or thought. I'd be curious if anyone in the audience also has other ideas as to um, better terms for region in Khmer. Like zoonotic diseases, which have captured the world's attention, including SARS diseases, such as COVID-19, drug-resistant malaria has been viewed in the global imaginary as a threat coming from Asia. Specifically, malaria resistant to frontline artemisinin-based drugs is clustered in the borderlands of the greater Mekong subregion in Southeast Asia and China. More specifically, over the past 60 years, Resistance to other anti-malarials has also emerged in the regions of Western Cambodia near the border with Thailand, chloroquine around 1957, pyrimethamine in the late 1960s and artemisinins first reported in 2006. I share with malaria scientists the desire to understand the question, why here? I've been tracking discourse and practice of malaria elimination in Cambodia and in global health interventions over the past nine years. I began thinking about these questions with human geographer Uli Beisel in 2014, and then as part of the Sorema interdisciplinary study, Society Resistance Malaria, led by Frédéric Bourdieu, an anthropologist and based at the Institute Pasteur in Phnom Penh. Sarema studied health inequalities, changes in ecosystems, and spatial movements of populations. My contribution was an ethnography of malaria sciences. It involved interviews and informal conversations, participation in malaria research and policy workshops, short visits to provincial research sites, and analyses of scientific articles and policy reports. Sorema focused on labor migration within Cambodia, 
following the routes of migrants between villages, plantations, and forests, where the environment is rapidly changing and where inequalities are stark, where malaria is most prevalent. Malaria has long been environed in the plantation and embodied in the labor migrant. In this sense, the socioeconomic and environmental contexts of malaria in Cambodia and the greater Mekong subregion are not unusual. Migrant routes traverse forests and clearings, forest hearts carved out for logging and mining, forest edges receding to plantations and agricultural concessions, or relatively stable, abutting family plots and low mountains. Border zones between nation states are of importance because they are paradigmatically unequal places. International border zones, like the Thai-Cambodia border, and sub-national areas, the forest edge, the plantation edge, are biological, social, and economic environments where Anopheles mosquitoes bite, where medicines are in and out of stock, and where people do not stay put. Antimicrobial resistance tends to emerge in zones of inequality rather than absolute poverty. In this sense, the socioeconomic and environmental contexts of malaria drug resistance in Cambodia and the greater Mekong subregion are not unusual. In zones of inequality, have and have not are right up next to each other. People earn money and have it to spend on medicines, but not consistently. Bosses or commanders provide preventive treatment, but sporadically or not according to clinical recommendations, for example, as monotherapy or administering just one drug instead of a combination. Stark inequality, as Nguyen and Pichard argue, is a condition for the emergence of drug resistance because there is partial access to drugs, inadequate doses or courses of antimicrobials. How do malaria scientists work with anti-malarial drug resistance as a problem of Southeast Asian borderlands? How do they work within discourse of the greater Mekong subregion as an experimental site of malaria elimination, quote unquote, for Africa? The case of anti-malarial drug resistance brings forward two ways of doing region. Borderlands between and within states are important for the re-emergence and the emergence and the persistence of resistance. Southeast Asia and Africa become a region enacted through itineraries of drug resistance parasites, biographies of scientists and health professionals, materialities of post-colonial conflict. Studying resistance has pushed me to think about area, region, as not strictly spatialized, attuning to how phenomena emerge, in particular times and places, from biological and political differences within, such as borderlands, and similarities between, such as Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa relations. Malaria with delayed response to treatment with artemisinin-based drugs was reported in Western Cambodia around 2006 and was soon found in other border zones in Myanmar, Thailand, Thailand, Vietnam, Lao PDR, and Yunnan province in China. Artemisinins from the plant Artemisia annua, sweet wormwood, are relatively safe, act quickly, and are effective against different stages of the parasite life cycle. I'll just show two slides um, that show the complexity of the parasite life cycle. Um, these are images from the annals of the Khmer Soviet Friendship Hospital. This one is from 1969, uh, which is housed in the National Archives of Cambodia. But you can see on the right-hand side, uh, a, a schema for the life cycle and reproduction of the parasite. This is a more recent drawing um, from an article by Don Dorp et al. 
but it shows how in the top you can see where a mosquito bites and then going from different parts of the body through the liver uh, and then uh, emerging into a sexual reproductive phase to be bitten again and to continue reproducing. So that's a very simplified way of talking about the complexity of the parasite life cycle spanning mosquitoes and humans. And of course, malaria is also present in animals. So one of the benefits of artemisinin is that it is effective against these different stages of the parasite life cycle. And when combined with another drug in ACT or, or um, artemisinin combination therapy, the artemisinin does its work and then the partner drug sort of mops up um, whatever artemisinin couldn't kill. So it's a really uh, valuable tool. Um, it's the frontline treatment for falciparum malaria around the world. So artemisinin resistance is a new global health problem, but it's also a return. Over the past 60 years, resistance to other anti-malarials has emerged in the same region of Western Cambodia near the border with Thailand. Chloroquine around 1957 and pyrimethamine in the late 1960s. Some of these resistant strains traveled to Sub-Saharan Africa where the burden of malaria is heavy, causing the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. Cambodian and foreign scientists work under the specter of these previous drug failures. As such, Phnom Penh has become a regional hub of malaria science and policy. At a 2015 Cambodia Malaria Elimination Partners convening, which was organized by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the then director of Cambodia's National Center for Parasitology, Entomology and Malaria Control expressed tentative hope that Cambodia could be a model of elimination of disaster rather than an epicenter of it. We want to bring Cambodia's experience to the world, he said. Cambodia is the epicenter of artemisinin resistance. We don't want to be known as the country that spread resistance to the world. We also do not want to be faced with this. No one wants to be faced with this. The priority of the Ministry of Health and its partners, a consortium that includes the World Health Organization, international universities, government agencies, civil society organizations, and private foundations, has moved from the containment of artemisinin resistance in Cambodia to the elimination of malaria in the greater Mekong subregion. The World Health Organization's Mekong Malaria Elimination Program, started in 2017 and headquartered in Phnom Penh, supports elimination of all human species of malaria in six countries, Cambodia, China, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. The timeline for malaria elimination in the greater Mekong subregion is 2030. The Cambodian government aims to eliminate malaria by 2025, it's next year. I'm gonna play a short video, Technology Willing. It's about two minutes long, but this describes the scope and objectives of the malaria elimination program. In recent years, the Greater Mekong subregion has recorded the largest decline of malaria cases globally. In 2012, one person died every eight hours from malaria. By 2020, this reduced to one every three weeks. How has this been achieved? In 2018, Cambodia, China, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam signed the Ministerial Call for Action to eliminate malaria in the Greater Mekong subregion. This aims to eliminate all species of human malaria by 2030. From this initiative, 
WHO's Mekong Malaria Elimination Program was launched. The program works with WHO's Global Malaria Program, regional and country offices to monitor drug efficacy and strengthen surveillance systems, provide technical support on malaria elimination, support the development of national malaria elimination intensification plans and focalized aggressive approaches, advocate on prevention, diagnosis and treatment for malaria, and coordinate and publish epidemiological data through the Malaria Elimination Database. Since 2017, the subregion has seen a 51% reduction of cases. All countries have moved their commitment to eliminate P. falciparum malaria, the deadliest strain, from 2025 to 2023. The subregion is now entering the last mile of malaria elimination. This is thanks to the incredible efforts of national programs, partners, and donors, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative. Well, it's a promotional video uh, from from the uh, Mekong Malaria Elimination Program, uh, but it is important to note that there have um, been a dramatic reduction in cases uh, since there's been this intensification of resources from the Global Fund and the Gates Foundation. Um, They're in Cambodia is in what they call the last mile of malaria elimination, which means it's it, there haven't been local cases, um, locally derived cases, and so they're getting close to having zero um, transmission uh, of falciparum malaria, which is incredible. So targeted malaria elimination locates malaria care and control in the village, the forest, and the laboratory. That is away from the centralized clinic. The challenges in the greater Mekong subregion have been significant. There are five, five plasmodium species. There's diversity in the habits and habitats of mosquito vectors. The quote unquote hot populations are migrants, mobile laborers and ethnic groups who move between the forest and the village. The quote unquote hot spots are remote forested regions and politically contested border zones. Given these challenges, the goal is to interrupt malaria transmission temporarily. For low endemicity contexts such as Cambodia, the thinking goes that if interruption is long and complete enough, it will eliminate the parasite reservoir. Targeted malaria elimination activities include monitoring drug efficacy, strengthening reporting and surveillance systems, targeted drug administration, chemo prevention, drug prevention in specific populations, intermittent preventative treatment for people going in and out of the forest, fever screenings, testing and treatment, and then hammock nets treated with insecticide. And village malaria workers are the people doing most, most of this on the ground work. So being in the last mile of malaria elimination means that 83% of public health operational districts have reported no P. falciparum cases in the past three years. The Ministry of Health and Partners are currently focusing their work in the five provinces that account for 80% of the falciparum and mixed falciparum and Vivex cases, centering on forest goers and migrant and mobile populations who work in forests. In Cambodia and other parts of the greater Mekong subregion, there are test and treat programs for specific groups at international borders. So despite different concepts and objectives in malaria science, STS, that's science and technology studies, and in Southeast Asia studies, there's a sensitivity in all of these fields to borderlands as spaces that must be understood on their own terms, not only in relation to or as margins of a state center, and not only in terms of geographical space. As historian Tong Chai Winnichakul has shown, the greater Mekong subregion has a long history of multiple overlapping sovereignties in which power, 
was the dynamic ability to command human and animal labor and fruits of that labor rather than claims to land. In the 1800s, local chiefs described the border, borderlands between present day Thailand, Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia as quote, golden silver paths free for traders. For Thailand, diplomatic and military encounters with the French and British over the 19th century shifted conceptions of the border to a buffer zone and eventually to a line marked on a map. However, border lands are not lines on a map. As geographer Van Skendel writes, quote, the particularities of individual borderlands allow location specific ways of combining goods, labor, and capital for profit, benefiting from the advantages of two territorial systems of regulation and avoiding their disadvantages, end quote. This selective permeability of borders permits some flows of people, materials like medicines, money, but also the benefits and harms of these flows are distributed unequally among borderland populations. Furthermore, borderlands are dynamic. Scholars have called it like an accordion, a musical instrument that con contracts and expands to the pressures of social, economic, and political developments on both sides of the border. Borderlands are often zones of sharp inequality and complex power relations that involve nested triangles of local elites and peoples. The image on the right is a sort of a graphic representation of this idea of a nested triangle that within states, there are also sort of smaller triangles of relationships between local elites, um, everyday people, and then uh, central state governments. Another image of thought for borderlands is a worldwide honeycomb best studied through quote, process geographies of transnational flows. Think about these lines between provinces and at international borders and the role of roads. This is a photograph that I took uh, in Mandalkiri province, excuse me, in, in 2015, instead of a golden silver path, it's an ochre path for migrants and traders. So the commonalities that these scholars describe about borderlands apply to Cambodia's borderlands. Over the past 100 years, the border has marked Western Cambodia as Thai and then French and then Thai and then Cambodian. Its forests, rubies, sapphires and rice fields have made it a site of elite, elite enrichment, contested power and a vast migrant labor system. This, uh, these images are from a document from the National Archives, which is a, this, a thesis um, in medicine. Uh, the image on the right uh, talks about the different um, material resources and commodities, but also movements of people, so military um, and displaced persons, as well as um, objects, minerals, and precious stones. And this is from uh, a thesis that was published in 1999. This is another image that I've thought with uh, quite a bit, um, and it's from a website on the border camps um, uh, that I can provide the link for. I forgot to include that in the slide. Uh, but here, what it does is it shows the complexity of movements back and forth around the Thai-Cambodia border. Um, and just to emphasize that as scholars such as Catalia LMD and Lindsay French and many more scholars have studied um, the kind of different regimes of movement across the border over time. For example, massive movements of refugees during the Civil War, and then the ASEAN battlefields to marketplaces, economic integration, borders are sites of precarious labor migration, and illegal but licit, that is tolerated, activities such as logging. These are areas of inequality rather than absolute poverty, meaning that there is some access to healthcare and medicines. It's precisely this partial access, the inconsistent stock quality or course of treatment that contributes to the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. 
So this notion of borderlands is useful too for understanding malaria drug resistance at the subnational level. Here, borderlands are environmental. In Cambodia, malaria is acquired outside, mostly in the evening or nighttime, mostly concentrated in forests or near forest edges. The forest edge is ever shifting, giving way to rubber and cassava plantations, roads, and displaced people clearing new plots of land. At one of our Surema meetings in 2015, we discussed the issue of mosquitoes and deforestation. An anthropologist asked the entomologist to speculate about the habits of Anopheles dearus, one of the main malaria vectors. Is it thinkable that dearus can get out of the forest? Asked an anthropologist. Unlikely, replied an entomologist. Dearus can live for seven months. It's a monkey biting mosquito. It lays eggs on the ground, but bites more in the trees than on the ground. Something about their breathing apparatus means it's less likely to self-regulate and survive hot, dry weather. Dearest will not survive deforestation. Even patchy forest edges, former forests, and the border zones between plantations and forests are sites of heightened transmission. A sardonic interpretation then is that deforestation is good for malaria elimination. When Rat and I interviewed former malaria patients and their healthcare providers in Sraikatam village in Mondulkiri, northeastern Cambodia, men, women, and children regularly went to forests to gather wood or forest products. Men spent a few days in the forest, sleeping in hammocks with insecticide treated nets if available. People traveled through the forest to get from home to field or village or to the cool, clear stream for fishing and bathing. Vani, a farmer and mother of four, believes she got malaria while foraging in the forest. A popular village malaria worker in Sraikatum told us that the health center was out of malaria medicines from December to February. So patients bought malaria medicines in the private sector where the recommended three-day course of combination therapy cost a dollar. And on the right is one of the articles from a collaborator in the Surema project, who was also, I know, a CKS fellow. Um, I attended Passi's talk, I think it was last year or two years ago. Um, so there's a well-documented global history of plantations as a site of violence, overwork, malnutrition, disease, and political resistance. Set in tropics deemed, quote, uninhabitable for white Europeans, plantations continue to be concentrations of capitalist expansion, quote, interlocking workings of human worth, race, and space, end quote, in the, in the words of geographer Catherine McKittrick. In colonial Indochina, the workings of human worth, race, and space had deadly consequences. To take just one example, from the research of Mitch Asso, the Susanna rubber plantation had a 100% malaria infection rate among its laborers. In contemporary malaria elimination, plantation edges are a persistent malarial environment, persistent yet dynamic, shifting with planting and reaping. And migrant laborers, long the victim of malaria, continue to be the most vulnerable. One theory about the emergence of resistance in Cambodia has to do with the quality and use of artemisinin over time. Artemisinin became available in the mid 1970s and its long-term use as a monotherapy, often in counterfeit formulations of inconsistent quality, contributed to the selection of resistant parasites. This story of resistance involves processes that are general and universal, like selection, natural selection, parasite life cycles, these general and universal processes encounter the effects of local conditions, subtherapeutic drug levels in the blood that may result from availability or access to drugs, as well as the quality of the drugs themselves. Plantations are central because they are sites to which migrants, money, and medicines move unevenly, and they're carved out of forests where mosquitoes prefer to live. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
A second entangled area, perhaps a more striking topology of resistance, is a bipolar region involving the greater Mekong subregion and sub-Saharan Africa. The standard first paragraph of scientific articles, and my writing is not exempt, goes something like this. For the third time in the past 50 years, anti-malarial drug resistance has emerged from Northwestern Cambodia. It is now present in other border zones in the Mekong subregion. We must prevent the spread of artemisinin resistant parasites to regions where malaria is a serious problem, namely Sub-Saharan Africa. From the perspective of the World Health Organization, a global view is to be expected. Its responsibility is the world after all. So too is a global view expected from the Institut's Pasteur, which follow the territories and roots of French empire. Imperialism has shaped the geographies of medical science, as well as health and disease in Cambodia and elsewhere. French colonial medicine and biological sciences forged particular interactions between Africa and Southeast Asia. Experience of war and landmines may forge other interactions. This is a map uh, that's on the wall, or it was on the wall, at least in the Institute's Pasteur that shows the network of Pasteur Institutes. So this Africa Southeast Asia region I propose is formed by itineraries of drug resistant parasites, biographies of scientists and health professionals and materialities of post-colonial conflict. The majority of European scientists and health workers with whom I spoke had worked in Africa prior to coming to Cambodia. Their motivation for coming to work in Cambodia was to halt the spread of drug resistance to Africa. In the course of a conversation about his research, a French parasitologist at the Institut Pasteur expressed his commitment to me in a quiet but grave tone, I am here for the African people. He had worked in Madagascar. Others worked in Congo, Tanzania, Cape Verde, and Mali, all places of high malaria prevalence. In different ways and in different moments, these scientists were involved with efforts to adapt to the loss of first-line treatments due to drug failure. They tried to prevent the loss of life. For Martin, the head of mission for MSF Belgium, Medicine Sans Frontières Belgium, elimination was a way to bypass the problem of how to detect subclinical, that is asymptomatic levels of parasites. In 2015, Medicine Sans Frontières Belgium piloted a targeted elimination of falciparum malaria in the north of Cambodia bordering Thailand. MSF has a long history in this region. They were one of the first organizations to enter the country after the fall of Democratic Kampuchea in the 1980s and 90s, one of the few foreign organizations providing health services in Khmer Rouge enclaves at the border. The pilot malaria elimination project began with a surveillance survey and was followed by mass drug administration in a circumcised area. So that's giving, uh, giving medicines to everyone without testing first. Martin, a Belgian nurse, was surprised at the low prevalence of malaria in Northern Cambodia. With the help of Institute Pasteur's new mobile PCR laboratory, funds from the Gates Foundation, and analysis and modeling support from Oxford Mahidol Group that's based in Bangkok called Muru, it's driven much of the targeted malaria, malaria elimination interventions in the Mekong subregion. MSF searched for parasites in the blood of villagers. They were expecting prevalence of 7% or more, but found around 2% in one village and less than 1% in another. These numbers were small, but they were nonetheless significant in two ways. Seven of the 11 parasites, excuse me, Seven of the 11 positive cases carried plasmodium with the mutant alleles that indicate reduced sensitivity to artemisinin, what became known as a marker for resistance. And all of these cases were asymptomatic and had very low levels of parasites in their blood. So the cases, even though there were not many, a high prevalence, a high proportion of people with malaria, the people who had malaria had the form of malaria that was resistant to artemisinin drugs. The parasites had the um, genetic marker for this. 
When I asked Martin why MSF was interested in working on artemisinin and resistance, he replied, the main reason is Africa. P. falciparum is the killer in Africa. We have seen the devastating effects of previous resistances. I have seen it myself. I worked for years in Tanzania. MSF had been involved in getting artemisinin combination therapy affordable and scaled up in the face of chloroquine resistance in Sub-Saharan Africa. They did not want to do this again, scale up another drug in the face of mass failure of the first line treatment. Viesna, a Cambodian molecular biologist, described her research in terms of how different the artemisinin case is from previous resistances. Now, she said, we have a molecular marker for resistance. A mutation in the K13 propeller region of P. falciparum, something her lab at Institute Pasteur had the central role in discovering. This is a plaque in the Institut Pasteur um, that lists just some of the authors on this uh, very prominent article that was published in uh, the famous journal Nature, where they identified this marker in the parasite that suggests it is resistant to artemisinins. With mobile PCR screening in a van that can analyze samples in remote villages, it's possible to follow the resistant parasite genetically in real time, she said. With chloroquine and pyrimethamine, Viesna reminded me, these techniques of making resistance visible were available only years after it spread. In 2015, many eyes were on the MSF targeted malaria elimination project. At the Cambodia Malaria Elimination Partners convening, the young French epidemiologist who presented MSF's pilot work was grilled intensively by doctors from the Cambodian Ministry of Health. How are you reporting adverse events? How will we know about them? Which database are you using? At this time, the Cambodian government was critical of mass drug administration, though the policies changed in subsequent years. The minister's questions reminded me of those asked of another high profile experimental project, the 2003 clinical trial of tenofovir for prevention of HIV, now known as PrEP. Local and international NGOs had voiced concern about the risks and benefits. Then Prime Minister Hun Sen amplified the critique of foreign researchers acting on Cambodian bodies. He canceled the trial in 2003 as an act of sovereignty, protecting Cambodian people from being used, in his words, as guinea pigs. How will resistant parasites travel to Africa? Will they travel in the blood of migrant workers? Will they emerge independently? An Africa Southeast Asia region is also formed through post-colonial world ordering, assertions of sovereignty that include rejecting global health experiments and contributing soldiers to peacekeeping. In 2014, one fear was that artemisinin resistant parasites might travel from Cambodia to Africa with soldiers. Around the time I started working with the Sarema project, I was struck by the headline in the Cambodia Daily, RCAF in Africa, fears of drug resistant malaria. The photograph depicts Cambodian soldiers preparing to depart for a UN peacekeeping mission in Mali where they were to share demining and engineering expertise. Some involved in malaria control worried that soldiers would bring parasites back to Cambodia. Others worried that soldiers carry artemisinin resistant strains to Mali. Testing these soldiers before and after their missions was a complicated task, requiring coordination between the army, the United Nations, the Institut Pasteur and the National Malaria Center. Mali, like Cambodia, was colonized by the French. Both Mali and Cambodia were viewed by the French as less economically and politically important than their neighbors, what is now Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire, and what is now Vietnam. Thus, the infrastructure, civil service, education, and health systems were less elaborated relative to their neighbors. Post-colonial Mali, like Cambodia, endured civil, regional, and global conflict related to the Cold War and the pressures of structural adjustment, 
and globalization. Mali, unlike Cambodia, is a malaria endemic country with seasonal malaria caused almost exclusively by B. falciparum and frontline treatments consisting of artemisinin-based drugs. In 2014, Cambodian troops went to Mali as part of MINUSMA, the UN multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali, which lasted from 2013 to 2023. In 2014, the only country in Africa with confirmed artemisinin partial resistance was Rwanda. So at the time that the soldiers went. However, since as of 2023, molecular markers of artemisinin partial resistance have been confirmed in Eritrea, Uganda, and Tanzania. Understandably, preventing both the spread and the independent emergence of malaria resistant to artemisinins and partner drugs has been of the highest importance. Another way that <clears throat> the, this region from Africa and Southeast Asia is produced, Cambodia specifically, <clears throat> is through the traveling of health interventions. In some of the archival research that I did uh, in medical theses from the 90s and also reading um, editions of newspapers from the 90s and 2000s, uh, there's an explanation of the work, uh, malaria control work being done in different parts of Cambodia. And this is a, a map of malaria and formerly inaccessible Khmer Rouge areas. And it's around this time in the late 90s, 97, 98, 99, that people left Anlang Bang in all directions to escape fighting. And in 1998, there was a malaria epidemic and dengue epidemic due in part to El Nino conditions. So these malaria control efforts in the 90s in former Khmer Rouge controlled zones ended up providing models for work in, in malaria control in Southern Africa. So some of the models, the practices that were kind of traveled from Cambodia to Africa were to combine food and malaria control, such as bed nets in context of hunger, to combine measles vaccination and malaria control, and to provide pre-packaged combination drugs. Cambodia was the first country to distribute these nationwide in the late 90s. So this is an example, uh, both in the 90s and what's based on the science that's happening in the present moment of how um, global health practices, public health practices are uh, travel out from Cambodia to um, affect practices in other parts of the world. So reaching my conclusion, um, malaria elimination programs work within these histories of multiple sovereignties and of a notion of power as the ability to control flows of people, parasites, medicines, as well as timber and gold. As ethnographies of malaria illuminate multi-species relations between people, environments, and mosquitoes, the challenge for an ethnography of resistance is to investigate social and biological factors involving people, parasites, drugs, and scientists in borderlands. I've proposed that techno-scientific discourse and practice of working with malaria drug resistance in the greater Mekong subregion shows the entanglements of different ways of making region. One of these ways is centering borderlands between and within states. Another is enacting Africa, Southeast Asia as a region. Together, they're part of a growing interest among Southeast Asia studies scholars to study, quote, trans-regional comparative entanglements. That's Chua et al. from 2019. Migrants have been central actors in global malaria histories and futures because they move and malaria parasites move with them. Ecology too is not static. In Cambodia, rapid deforestation for plantation agriculture changes where and how people work and sleep and where villagers go to cultivate, gather, fish, and hunt. Plantations are sites to which migrants, money, and medicines move unevenly, and they are carved out of forests where mosquitoes prefer to live. These changing positions make hospitable conditions for the development of drug resistance. 
Elimination is the mood of our time. Not everyone living and working in the greater Mekong subregion subscribes to artemisinin resistance as the primary crisis of malaria. There are crises of detection, of bad drugs, of access to diagnosis and care, prevention of child death. We can understand these too as histories, histories of war, mining and migration at the border, histories of medicine use and genetic surveillance, biologies of parasites that mutate, mosquitoes that shift with changes in forest habitat and humans enacting those changes. Artemisinin resistance in Cambodia and the greater Mekong subregion might be a history of a place, a history of a parasite, or in the future, a history of UN missions and global health interventions. What are the regions in, with, or against which we work? How are they made? Through which boundaries, which characteristics? Are you or the people you work with experimenting with regioning, perhaps as a technique for denaturalizing harmful relations or making a space to live otherwise? Thank you. Hey. Thank you so much, Jenna. That I share John Marston's comment that this is fascinating and far reaching work. Um, before we delve into this really, really interesting problem that you discussed and difficulties and challenges of solving this very difficult and complex problem, I just want to say one on a very broad method, method, methodological level, I'm fascinated by this project as an inter, you know, a model of interdisciplinary research and applied practice. Um, you know, as we talk about some of the significant problems that are facing the world today and in the environment and in health and in economics of homelessness and poverty and educational disparities, you know, these, uh, these difficult, complex problems cannot be adequately understood by a single discipline. They require multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches. And the, the project that you've been working on and you've been describing here, that you've been working on for the last 10 years and been describing for the last hour, seems to be a model of that kind of interdisciplinary research to understand the problem adequately enough to be able to um, address it effectively. So I was just fascinated on just on a very general met methodological level by, by that. Um, you know, your project, you know, has involved parasitologists, <laughs> or anthropologists like yourself, policymakers, um, health professionals, the Medicine Sans Frontier, biologists are this incredible combination of, of stakeholders in, in, this, in this difficult problem of eradicating drug-resistant malaria um, by the WHO goal of 2030 and Cambodian goal of next year, 2025. So if, if you will allow me, um, because I came to this completely new, and, and this, um, had no previous understanding or knowledge of this problem, um, just to try to restate it uh, for myself and perhaps some of the other participants here today, some of the, our visitors to the webinar. Um, you know, here we are in 2024, as you mentioned and presented in the short video, the last mile of eliminating malaria, um, completely eliminating drug resistant malaria, specifically the artemisinin, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, yeah. artemisinin resistant malaria strains that um, are, are the most challenging. So the, the goal of eliminating drug resistant malaria faces, as you've described it, there's a, a very complicated challenge here that these last strongholds of these drug-resistant malaria are these borderland regions, these 
nefarious, nebulous areas that are so difficult to address um, in terms of monitoring and treatment, which I guess are the two sort of, as you described the main um, tactics for doing this. So um, I guess the question, my first question, uh, if I could pose it to you is um, to, to um, help me understand, and maybe others understand a little better how this reimagining of region will enable this uh, project to reach its conclusion, to complete the, the last mile. What are the difficulties of reimagining? Why does, why does borderlands and edges of the forest and, um, and migrant labor um, pose such a difficult problem? I think you described that well enough in terms of the difficulties of monitoring and treatment but could you go into a little bit more how um, the perhaps the colonial imperialistic past histories of these regions um, create a, um, a difficulty for um, applying some of the solutions of monitoring and treatment? Just going into it a little bit more, clarifying it a little bit more so we can understand the challenges of, 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 of this last mile. Uh, thank you so much for those comments. And, and also reflecting back is very helpful for me <laughs> to think about what how I'm phrasing things. And first of all, I just want to clarify that the Sorema project was not my project. I joined it, but it was really led by others. Just to be sure that that's clear, that was led by Frederic Bourdieu and um, uh, Didier Menard at Institute Pasteur and Pascal Hans Schumacher. So there was a group of people working on this project that I joined sort of towards the tail end, but that's what started my own study of uh, um, malaria drug resistance in Cambodia. Um, and I think that the interdisciplinarity part has long been an interest of study for me because I have an interest in kind of practices and philosophy of science. So I'm interested in how different people uh, think about evidence or their methods or um, what it is to produce useful knowledge, what it is to disseminate knowledge, and so um, what counts as knowledge. And so those sorts of um, questions were just so rich within the collaboration because it was a group of people who wanted to talk about this, which is unusual, right? Uh, people are often sort of so pressured by their demands of their jobs, scientists and anthropologists and everyone that they, it's, even though we say we like interdisciplinarity, there's actually very little reward for it, right? Or support for it institutionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and book, in terms of like, so there were arguments about whether we should publish in a journal, like an open access journal, like Malaria Journal, or in an edited volume, which is more what anthropologists might want to do, right? But then very few people would be able to read that. And so the, the sort of nuts and bolts of this interdisciplinarity have to be worked out um, alongside the sort of theoretical questions about how do we conceive of a migrant and how do we think about spatial politics, those sorts of things. And to me, that's it's just been a longstanding interest. Um, and I think malaria scientists are particularly attuned to that because of the complexities of malaria spread because it's environmental, it's multi-species. And so the people that I've talked to and certainly a lot of the literature that I've read is really um, mindful in the way that some other um, public health epidemiology uh, are, are, are less so in my opinion about this kind of interspecies and environmental interrelationships. And that's just, Kind of the history of malaria and people's interest in um, always shifting with a moving target of the forest changing. You know, in other parts of the world, it's the malaria isn't a forest uh, disease. It has to do with um, pools of water and sort of peri-urban areas, right? So it sort of shows up differently in different relationships to agriculture and deforestation. Um, so that's also that kind of constantly changing um, uh, uh, manifestations of malaria, I think, are um, super very frustrating, right? Um, because it's uh, something that 
we certainly know many different ways to prevent it and and now to eliminate it but um but different strategies have had more success than others over the years and sort of geographers i think have taken the lead in also showing some of those that are it's not just about a medicine or about a vaccine um, at my university there's a lot of people trying to develop a vaccine but as to whether this research of mine can help the very dedicated scientists working on the last mile of elimination um I don't, I feel quite modest about the ability for it to help. My hope is that um, it would amplify kind of their concerns, like raise up their concerns and give it a language to travel, not just in public health or sort of economic or donor terms, but sort of in, in ways that um, can help us think about these complex kind of human animal um, diseases, right? That of course, which SARS is one of them and COVID is another. Um, and that there's much to be gained from thinking about say colonial histories of plantation labor, right? And how those get sort of re-inscribed at different moments through different capitalist practices. So I'm certainly not an expert on um, kind of land concessions, but there are a lot of people working on this in Cambodia sort of studying um, the the convoluted sort of unwritten rule in Alice Vaban's terms of sort of like how property changes hands, who's allowed to work on it, what what sorts of activities are permissible on on land. But to me, that kind of question of land is one of the most urgent for scientists of all disciplines right now um, and dispossession. Um, these border areas then are, I think, involving these kind of intensified um, economic activities then, or whether it's for trade, but also the way that militaries have historically been involved in the trade. Um, so that's local police, but also provincial and and national. So there's, there's so many nested sort of sovereignties of people who have their fingers in the pie, right? <laughs> of, of benefiting from either permitting things to flow across borders or stopping them from flowing across borders, right? Just like that, that ability to control either the, the flow or the non-flow of people and materials is, is so complex. Um, and I definitely look to other Southeast Asia study scholars for how they've studied that in the border. Um, you know, including, especially, I assume when you talk about allowing or, or not allowing um, the movement of, of things across the border, the medicines and the vaccines and the treatment and the monitoring, uh, that is um, regulated by these actors, the, the military, the various people who police these borders. Yeah. So what, 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 what are your proposals or what are your thoughts about addressing these complex issues of the borderland as a, a reimagining this this region, reimagining the region as, what, what is the approach towards that in your mind? Well, I will say very quickly, and maybe we can delete it from the tape, but I also don't think borders should be policed. <laughs> that's like my own political commitments, but um, but I, I'm not saying that, recommending that for necessarily the Mekong subregion, but that's just the way that I think about um, social life. Uh, so um, opposed to kind of the violence of, of restriction, basically, and that the criminalization is what causes a lot of problems, whether it's a mm -hmm. um, certain gambling or sex work or, you know, all sorts of things, drug use, it's it, those, it's the criminalization in my view. So borders are a site where because there are different legal regimes, um, they kind of abut next to and there's profit to be made in kind of bouncing between two different legal and economic regimes. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that, but there's also um, for the kind of social and humanistic sciences, not to forget the the kind of agency and 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 activity of biological materials, right? Parasites don't just follow military rule, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and and even migrant laborers don't just follow customs and border protection, right? People, mm. uh, you know. It, people but particularly environments and and microbes like parasites they they slip through and they evade and so it's a way of thinking of borders 
as not just sort of politically and socially particular areas, but also that there are, um, there are environmental and biological specificities to these areas too. Mm -hmm. And one of which I've tried to, um, I tried to talk about a bit is just some of the work that's been done in medicine and, and in anthropology around kind of how resistance emerges in these friction zones, basically. Um, but there's mm -hmm. certainly other ways of looking at kind of mining and deforestation, these radical projects, logging uh, to alter um, uh, environments that are not just in borderlands, but borderlands become an important site for the transit of those um, those commodities. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, let's let's. There's a question here from John Marston, so let's get to Hi, that John. one first. Yeah, um, I assume coming to to us from Mexico. Um, yeah. This is a fascinating, far-reaching work, as I mentioned before. You that that John mentioned. Um, I would like to know more about village malaria workers. Who are they exactly? How are they being funded? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't have um, the, a perfect kind of like solid factual answer for you on that. <laughs> but I can say generally what I know, which is that village malaria workers tend to be women. They're not only women, um, but they're often people who have some sort of positive repu rep reputation in the village. Sometimes they're part of commune leadership, um, but but not, not always and not necessarily. Um, and people come to their house for testing and then they also travel. So as malaria cases have gone down and there's these harder and harder to reach kind of pockets, um, they're more mobile, so sort of going to places where workers are sleeping at night or going to different villages. Um, uh, the malaria workers, village malaria workers that I spoke to were based in very small villages in Mondulkiri, and they did some house visits, but they also, mostly people also came to them. They knew where they lived. They were sort of known in the community. And then um, that person would collect the rapid diagnostic tests and, and um, they were part of a research study. So the funding uh, came from, it comes from different agencies, from the ministry, the Cambodian government, from the global fund, uh, from um, different, uh, uh, the pres uh, mm -mm -mm -mm. the different organizations that are both kind of multilateral and NGO that fund malaria related work but the government is also funding some of those. So I don't have a perfect answer for that. And I'm maybe there's someone on the call who knows exactly the details of that, so. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, thanks John for that question. Yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm kind of stuck here on this question of policing of, of the border. Oh, um, yeah. And it, it, it seems to be perhaps maybe the last real sticking point to accomplishing this objective of, of eliminating these drug resistant malarial strains. Um, and it relates, I suppose, to many other complex problems like human trafficking, as we've mentioned, and, 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 and um, the health issue of, of drug use, et cetera. Um, yeah. Would you agree with that, that this policing of the border becomes the main impediment to the monitoring and the treatment of these drug resistant strains that um, you know is, are, are required for accomplishing the objective of reaching this last mile. Is it the main issue here um, or are I there other? Yeah, uh, I don't feel actually, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm qualified actually to answer that if that's the main, uh, sort of a main impediment. It's Certainly um, something that uh, migrant laborers, for example, going from Cambodia to Thailand have, have been a source of from coming from Laos to Cambodia or, or Cambodia to Laos or to Vietnam, right? That these are also, it's not just Cambodia specific, these sort of border testing areas, Laos mm -hmm. and Thailand. Um, uh, organizations have done great work in setting up um, programs to test specific groups of people at the border, but it requires, you know, cooperation with um, authorities. And so the police- Cooperation, is, that, is there a lack of the cooperation that, that you found? I mean, obviously it sounds like 
reaching the last mile means identifying and tracking these migrant labor groups that are carrying these drug resistant strains and providing the necessary treatment and um, that to them. So they, they, they're a moving target because they're obviously they're migrant laborers that are moving around. So it's difficult to identify and track. Um, is, is there the cooperation that's required to do that? Yeah, George, I just don't, I can't um, say because that hasn't been the kind of focus of what I've looked at recently. Um, but I do think that most of the last mile activities are not necessarily at international borders, but within these kind of what I've called what I called subnational borders. So these areas that are environmentally sort of borders between forest and village or forest mm -hmm. and field, right, or plantation and forest edge. So yeah. that's sort of following people as they're moving for labor there. Um, has been what I've noted to be more of the focus. But I, um, in other, for example, in Myanmar and Mesat, uh, that's also dealing with refugee kind of population that's kind of encamped and, and actually somewhat stable, but still people are moving back and forth within Thailand and across the Myanmar and Thai border. Um, mm -hmm. and also Vietnam. But again, if there's, there may be someone on the call who has sort of like more of an expertise in that area, so mm. I would welcome them to type something in. <laughs> Policing is hard to study. So my, one of my graduate students, I showed a picture of her cat, Liam D, who's now a professor in, at Chulalongkorn University, but she, her, her doctoral research was on the um, Thai-Cambodia border. Uh, more from a perspective of the Thai side, um, but, uh, but sort of the, the, it was it was delicate and dangerous work, frankly, to do that ethnographic research, sort of mm -hmm. spending time with migrant laborers, but also students who cross the border for school yeah. and mushroom gatherers and you know different um, people doing different kinds of work, sort of in these borderland areas. Let's shift then to the other border that you mentioned, this border between forests and beyond the forest, the edge of the forest. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the problems that that poses to reaching this last mile. Um, one of the th interesting things that you pointed out is that there's this conception that deforestation is good for the elimination of malaria because these drug resistant mosquitoes will not survive outside of the forest. So there's that, there's that kind of paradox there that yeah. something that we consider bad deforestation would actually be good for, for eliminating for reaching the last mile. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that side of the problem, this idea of the edge of the forest as, as an area of difficulty? I mean, my uh, what I would love to be able to do, and I haven't been able to do it, is to actually do research sort of at, the, at these edges, but plantations are quite also militarized, frankly, right? Like they're sort of borders and who's allowed to come in and see what's happening there. It's hard to get permission to actually go inside. Um, so some of the historical research, for example, um, about rubber plantations in what is now Krache, but sort of was in this border area between Vietnam and Cambodia, done by historian of science, Mitch Asso, he, um, uh, you know, was able to look at French colonial kind of documents, records of um, both health uh, officers who were trying to work inside plantations and even for government ministers at the time. Within the colonial administration, it was hard to work um, uh, within the, the, like with specific planters, but then there were specific owners of plantations who requested support from the colonial um, government. And uh, so it sort of depends on those relationships as well. But the um, to me that an interesting part of that work is how well it connects to kind of other interdisciplinary work um, around the globe. So I have a colleague in medical anthropology who's doing research um, in Honduras, and he's interested in sort of worker activism, but also public health interventions in plantations, specifically around heat exposure. Um, also people studying heat exposure among workers in Florida and sort of getting, trying to work with both workers and within a plantation is, um, is, is difficult because they know that there's a critique <laughs> that's coming from, from both the health workers and from public, uh, from social scientists. But they, 
um, the plantation as a figure of kind of racial capitalism over the past 350 years um, it also makes for um, their insights, I think, from these studies of plantations as um, kind of racialized labor forms that help us to think about them also as these hotspots of disease, as they've been called. Sort of what are the dynamics that are happening there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating that these, 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 these sticking points to, <laughs> to, to this last mile, these yeah. complex micro areas um it's so maybe uh, what we need is a like an economist in our interdisciplinary studies <laughs> or like a business administration person <laughs> you would think right as someone who can unravel the the um i guess the economic elements here yeah. um the, you know, the la labor economists, you know, someone who look at right. that way. Well, I think geographers have done and sort of development studies, at least that's the work I'm a bit more familiar with in Southeast Asia, but sort of the studies of um, um, kind of both historical and contemporary studies of kind of labor and extraction practices um, and sort of inequalities that are sort of maintained and created anew through those those projects. Well, um, before I ask you to make any final comments or yeah. statements that you need to make, I mean, um, the obvious question I guess I have now to before closing is that Cambodia is set next year as the goal for eliminating malaria in Cambodia. Um, that's not far away. And given the sticking points that we've discussed, um, what do you see as the, the chances of, of accomplishing that goal? I mean, it seems optimistic. There's there's <laughs> always, I, I, I mean, I'm optimistic, I guess is what I should say. Mm -hmm, I, see. Um, yeah. I think there's always a debate among public health workers in Cambodia and, um, and others abroad about the sort of the quality of the data, the epidemiological data, and sometimes that can um, spin out into like very technical terms, but it could also be, you know, how much are we basing policy on, on sort of certain ways of modeling, for example, what's happening. Definitely been in heated discussions between epidemiologists and modelers about um, how do how will we know, right? Because it's all it's all a kind of a best guess. <laughs> mm, yeah. Because even the report of no cases is, um, you know, based on a center, based on someone showing up and getting tested, and then based on the the mm -hmm. center where the test happened reporting it. Right? There's so many chains where that those that sort of those numbers can fail to materialize. But I um, I'm I take that all as just a part of the way that science is done. So it's it's not a failure on anyone's part, but it's something that we're trying to we're using as one of the tools to try to understand um, the changing face of malaria control. And I think that elimination, there's no doubt that the um, cases have gone way down. I mean, even just in the scheme of when I started looking at this and to now, it's a dramatic change. Um, mm. But there is malaria in other parts of the world that's much more serious and uh, consequential. Mm -hmm. There's been rising cases of child deaths in sub-Saharan Africa. There's like really serious concerns um, in other in other parts of the world. So I guess just to emphasize that this kind of what's happening in the greater Mekong subregion is sort of a uh, somewhat controlled and effective intervention in my view. Um, mm -hmm. And and and. and if and it sounds like, and hopefully, there will be lessons learned here that can be applied in Sub-Saharan. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, that that question about one of some of the scientists that I talked to were saying, "Oh, we're working here with models that came from Bangladesh, but they don't make sense in Priva here, right?" So it's sort of like this question of where the models are coming from and how mm -hmm. they're being translated in practice, and then mm -hmm. where we go after is also kind yeah. of an interesting. One. A whole new set of problems translating these, these yeah. best practices to a new well, context. 
And also sort of what are the major health problems facing Cambodians? I mean, there's debate about how much resources should go to this as opposed to um, diarrhea, nutrition, um, mm -hmm. diabetes, right? High blood pressure, these things mm -hmm. that have much higher morbidity um, in mm -hmm. Cambodia than malaria, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully enough resources to accomplish the goal of eliminating it by next year. Thank you so much for your questions. And <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you too. And is there any, before we finish, is there any last comments or? No, things? I just want to thank people who, um, who came and um, I'm happy to follow up. Uh, you can find me online pretty easily through my email. And so. I saw some okay. sprinkling of scientists and I would love to be in touch. So. Well, thank you so much. I, I've been really interested and fascinated by your talk and um, I think everyone has learned a lot and enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> thank you. See yeah, out. Chinabria, hello, Samadhi. I see you there. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Chinabria. Mm-hmm.